we have our panel discussion. Even more content for you. Three of SecureWorks recognized Microsoft most valuable researchers are about to share their vulnerability findings reported to Microsoft over the past year. So very, very excited about this. And so I want to please welcome Tony Gore, security researcher, Dr. Nestori Cinema, security principal, security researcher, and Jusoa Santasalo, senior principal security researcher. And of course, leading the way, joining me up on the stage, it is Dr. Clay Moody, senior director. Hello, how are you doing? Great, Sarah, how are you? Yes, very, very good, thank you. I'm excited about this panel. And of course, if we look to our left, the team are here. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hello. Brilliant. Well, we can see you, we can hear you loud and clear. So, Dr. Clay, I'm going to leave the team with you in your good, capable hands. I'm re really looking forward to this session. Awesome. That's great. Well, I'm glad to be here. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. This is going to be a really great panel discussion with some really talented members of the detection research team here at the Counter Threat Unit at SecureWorks. So, I'm really excited to not be talking and allow them to have a chance to talk. And so, Let's go to our panelists and let's just have a chance for each of you to introduce yourselves. And so let's start with you, Nestor. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, where you live in the world? And what we're going to do is we're going to show a slide that is the highlight of all the findings that we've publicly released with this year. And I want you, uh, Nestor, and this question will apply to all of our panelists, if our viewers only had a chance to read one of these, which one would you make the case that they should look into? And that's sort of your introductory and opening question. And so we'll start with you, Nestor. Um, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Clay. So my name is Dr. Nestor Sunima. I'm based in Finland, and and uh, I'm a senior principal security researcher, uh, and I've been with with uh, SecureWorks two and a half years now, and I'm focusing on pretty much everything related to Microsoft Cloud, but especially anything um, involved with identity kind of makes me tick, and about those. Findings, I would say that I would recommend that password authentication or PTA for a couple of reasons. So first of all, we actually found some novel attack parts that nobody else hadn't found before, hopefully. And um, the one thing is that those are actually non-detectable using current Microsoft stack. So there's no log events or anything that you could show you that you, are, have, uh, you have been compromised. But we actually found a way to detect that, and we also like published a tool for that, which is open source and available for everybody. So let's start that with that. <laughs> Excellent. That's, that's a great case to, to look into that one, and we appreciate you sharing that with us. Uh, so we're going to take the same question, introductory qu uh, opportunity to introduce yourself, and which of the reports would you uh, recommend? And we'll start with you, Joshua, and let you have a chance to answer this. Let me just take my hacking glasses off first. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm uh, Joshua Sandasalo. I'm actually Nestor's colleague. Uh, I've been doing uh, Microsoft focused uh, security research for the past seven years, uh, a lot of it in the identity space. And uh, about a year, year ago, in, in August 2020, uh, I got a, uh, an offer to join. Uh, this wonderful uh, company of us and uh, to work with some fantastic folks. So probably a bit like or like Nestor, I, I live uh, where the Santa Claus lives. That's uh, Finland and uh, the, the land of uh, many saunas. And if I pick one from there, um, Probably just to highlight uh, would be the, the critical finding we found uh, in, in Power Platform that uh, in, enabled uh, or would have enabled any any uh, attacker to gain a, a lot of privileges in the Power Platform, which is the, the low code platform for Microsoft. So yeah, that would be my, my pick there. Awesome, Joshua, thanks. Um... Uh, great. That's a great one to find. Definitely stressing the severity of it, and, and it is one of our more recent uh, published ones. So, uh, definitely a, a strong recommendation there. Uh, so let's go with Tony. Tony, uh, same question. Introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about you. How long you've been with SecureWorks? Where you've worked on other you know, other teams? And then also, what would be your recommended uh, advisory to read? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my name is Tony Gore. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I'm a security researcher with the Counter Threat 
unit detection research team. Uh, prior to becoming a security researcher, I was a pen test consultant with the adversary group and performed adversarial testing uh, in external, internal Kubernetes and cloud based pen test engagements. Um, I'm also one of the developers of the Whiskey Samuel and Friends Golden Samuel Attack Framework, uh, where I presented at Black Hat USA and Black Hat Europe, both Arsenal. Um, I currently hold 11 cybersecurity certifications, including the OSCP, the OSCE, the OSWP, the OSWE, the OSEP, and the OSEE. Uh, I am currently a student at the SANS Technology Institute working towards my Master's of Science in Information Security Engineering. Um, and prior to working at SecureWorks, I was a field radio operator in the United States Marine Corps. Um, as for the uh, reports that I'd recommend, I would recommend reading the Azure Active Directory Domain Services Privilege Escalation Report because it's an interesting use case where we have a relatively newer exploit, but potum, uh, and a relatively older attack path of resource-based constraint delegation that we combine to obtain a Kerberos ticket for the Microsoft Microsoft own enterprise admin account, which let us dump the empty hashes of all the users synced to the Azure Active Directory domain services environment and allowed us to perform additional research uh, surrounding the uh, Azure Active Directory domain services environment from the Azure side. Awesome. Yeah, that is definitely a great read and uh, I appreciate you highlighting that for us. All right. So, um, Dr. Cinema, we have, uh, you know, we know you travel around the world, you talk at multiple events, you've talked to Black Hat, DEF CON, uh, Troopers, you've even gone out to Blue Hat and presented. Uh, talk to us, when you go to the community and you're sharing these findings that, that we have as a team, that you have it yourself, and what are the, what's the one that's getting the most attention out there from our, uh, you know, from our partners across the community? Yeah, actually, good question. So. I think the most attention uh, got my talk in Troopers last summer. It was called Dumping Anti Hashes from Azure AD. And that's actually uh, the Tony's research, what, what he mentioned was the one that made, me, made it possible for us to research that. So they were actually able to compromise Micros managed uh, domain controllers in cloud. And that allowed me to study how it actually worked. So, and this is, Again, a very novel attack because nobody knew that you can actually dump anti hashes from Azure AD, and we mm. proved that that is possible. So during this uh, research, thanks to Tony and, and other colleagues, uh, we learned how those hashes are synchronized from on-prem to Azure AD, and then from Azure AD to those Azure AD domain services servers. Uh, we now know how they are uh, encrypted and also how they are decrypted, so we can actually dump those. Luckily, this attack is nowadays um, theoretical because Microsoft fixed whatever Tony found. So we are, at, at least now we are, we are safe. Yeah, I mean, that's ultimately what we want. You know, it's great to have something we can take advantage of, but if it'll be fixed, that really will help us uh, in the long run. But speaking of that, that was great to highlight the collaboration across the group. It's not just a bunch of individuals doing work, but working alongside. And you mentioned you worked with Tony. And so Tony, the next question is for you. You know, you mentioned your background as an adversarial tester with our SWAG team. Um, having the, th the thought process and the mentality to think of things like a bad guy does, how does that help you not only be a better researcher and find vulnerabilities and, and find ways of, of, of taking advantage of them, but at the same time, how, do, how can that be applied back into the adversarial testing services that we provide as a company? Uh, absolutely. Um, uh, so thinking like a bad guy allows you to think about impact at a greater level. Uh, when you identify a vulnerability in an application and report it to Microsoft, uh, two things have to be present for Microsoft to fix the issue. The Number one, the vulnerability has to be replicated by Microsoft. And number two, the impact of the vulnerability has to be severe enough to be worth fixing. Uh, so let's say, for example, you have an app, a web application that tracks uh, each user's user agent and renders the user agent as part of the application. An attacker could inject a cross-site scripting payload into the user agent string and the application would render that payload resulting in a successful attack. The problem here is that the user agent string that gets rendered by the application changes per request and per site user, meaning the payload is reflected and the only person becoming a victim in that scenario is the attacker themselves. In this scenario, the vulnerability exists and can be replicated, but the impact is almost zero because the attacker is the only person that would be impacted by the vulnerability. So having the adversarial mindset enables us to think through the impacts of the vulnerabilities that we find so that we can more effectively communicate with Microsoft what the problem is and why it needs to get fixed right away. Um, and to answer your question about how this, this research 
can be applied to adversarial testing. Uh, we have a close relationship with the adversary group, and sometimes we find issues that Microsoft can't or is unable to fix. When those situations happen, we have what's called an abuse case scenario. Uh, and this is where we've identified and reported an issue to Microsoft, and Microsoft has responded with something along the lines of this is by design or this is not a vulnerability. Uh, once that happens, we start having conversations with the adversary group testers and start sharing information about the abuse cases with the consultants on that team, uh, which allows us to take our bleeding edge research uh, at immediate apply our lessons learned to current and ongoing pen test, helping us have an immediate impact on safeguarding our customers real time. No, that's just great. And that's super powerful. And it just talks about how we can take our research and, and apply benefits to our customers. And, you know, let's, if we think about the other side of our consulting services and our incident response, uh, Joshua, recently you've been able to have some of your findings that you've learned about that we've actually been to apply in active cases uh, for customers and obviously not talking about who the customers are or any details. Can you just talk a little bit about how our research is able to be used in the incident response uh, practice? Oh yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And uh, probably to kind of uh, also speak what, what Tony, Tony said, um, we, we deal a lot with Azure AD applications. Uh, that, that's the identity side of our research. And uh, understanding actually how those applications work from protocol wise, how customers are using those, how uh, the red teaming assignments are using Azure AD applications. It's actually given us uh, a lot of view uh, to find the vulnerabilities, but also to understand uh, the by design behavior, which is actually what the trade actors will be using. And uh, without going into any any uh, customers and, and and further details. I, I'd still say that the uh, threat actors have definitely started using uh, the what I would say uh, by design issues uh, with the applications and and they are having a field day with those. And uh, yeah, that's that's probably okay. the kind of tagline there, the field day. That's <laughs> that's what we see. That's great, that's great. Um, I want to come back to you, Joshua, with a second question. When Sarah introduced you, um, the team, they mentioned that all three of you have been recently been recognized as Microsoft uh, Most Valuable Researchers, or MVRs. Can you talk to us a little bit about what that is, what does that mean, and, and what, is, what kind of honor is that to be named as such? Yeah, so um, MVR stands for the Most Valuable Researchers, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, the cool thing is that it is actually something very concrete. So uh, when you report these vulnerabilities to Microsoft, uh, Microsoft keeps track of them, uh, MSRC in this case. So uh, from our team, I, I think Nestor has been MVR for three consecutive years, um, meaning he's reported a, a great deal of vulnerabilities. Uh, I just kind of uh, took a number here and I would say to make into that list you have to have um, something of a three uh, high severity or five uh, uh, high severity submissions uh, maybe one critical in there uh, to get those points uh, to make into the top 100 uh, researchers listed in the uh, yearly annual listing so so it is very concrete thing it's it's about submitting cases uh, to Microsoft and, and getting points for those. Yeah, and I think it's important also to point out not, you know, you three were on this list, but also we had two additional uh, uh, consultants in our swag practice who also made the list. And so, you know, very well represented, re represented across the company. And of course, you know, uh, you know, we also recognize the, those two individuals also. Um, so, you know, kind of staying in the acronym SOUP uh, model, uh, Nestri, I know that you uh, Ju and Joshua both maintain a Microsoft MVP uh, designation. Can you explain to to our audience a little bit what that means and kind of like how, what's the process of going about and becoming a Microsoft MVP? Yes, so MVP stands for Microsoft Most Valuable Professional, and of course it's an honor to uh, have the, that recognition or be one of the one of the uh, about two thousand MVPs I think there are currently. So to be an MVP, that first of all, it requires a nomination. So from another MVP or full-time Microsoft employer. And to get MVP, you need to do some work for the community, like outside of business hours. So 
not part of your work. So for instance, I'm publishing blog posts, I have released uh, open source tools, and I have been speaking in many conferences. Um, and how that keeps, our, allows us to keep community to be secure is that that's actually the closest relationship you can have with Microsoft without working for Microsoft. So it allows MVPs to get early access to information and services that that's not publicly available. The challenge is that we can't talk about those uh, even, even inside our company. So I can discuss with Joshua, but that's it because he's the, as far as I know, currently only MVP, other MVP we have. No, that is, that's, I mean, it is a great distinction. It's a great honor. Uh, to do that. It is, it's actually great to hear that a requirement is supporting the community and giving back and being engaged um, and that, you know, it does have some benefits that allow us to have access uh, as a company through, through yourself and Joshua. So that's awesome. Uh, Tony, I want to go back to you and, you know, as, as we've had this discussion, you've heard uh, your fellow researchers share thoughts and, um, and ideas. Is there anything that, like, you know, that you're thinking, hey, Clay, you forgot to ask me about this. It would be a great idea uh, if we got a chance to highlight this. And so is there anything else you want to share with our audience before we wrap? Uh, yeah. Uh, the only thing I'd, I'd really like to leave the, the the audience with, the group with, is to, to make sure that you're performing proactive testing, testing with teams like the adversary group, because uh, it's the only way you can identify weaknesses and areas of risk that you're immediately being affected by. Um, there's only so much that you can do without actually um, testing what your environment is. And, and without that testing, you won't have an, a good understanding of where your weak points are, or where your risks are. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, testing and, and understanding the weaknesses in your environment is important. And then taking the action to fix those uh, as much as you can. And if you can't fix those things, how can you prevent them and ultimately detect them if you can't prevent them? But you know, finding the vulnerabilities and fixing them is, is critical to your to cyber hygiene. I just want to thank our panelists for joining us. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, and I'm glad to have you on our team. I'm glad to be a part of the CTU and a part of SecureWorks and appreciate everything you do for the team. And uh, we look forward to continuing to follow the great work that we know you'll be doing in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Eva. Right. Thank you very much, guys. And Dr. Clay, that was fantastic. That went so quickly. Oh Did my we, goodness. Was it, were we short? Did we go over? No, just to exactly to time, but All my right. goodness, it, time certainly flies when you're having fun. That was so interesting. Thank you so, so much.